So, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight, tonight's talk, which has been given by Caroline Cannon Brooks, and uh, she is a long standing supporter of the Friends of Czech Heritage. And I am Peter Jameson, and I'm the chairman of the Friends. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the Friends, we are a charity dedicated to the conservation of Czech heritage, um, historic buildings, um, and artifacts. And you can find out more about us on our website, including details of how to donate. We would love you to donate modest sums. That would be most helpful. So um, I'd like now to ask um, uh, Barbara Peacock, who is one of our founders, to um, uh, introduce our speaker this evening. That's Caroline Cannon Brooks. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, I'm delighted to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Caroline Cannon Brooks, who will already be known to many of you here this evening. Um, after graduating from the Courtauld Institute, Caroline taught art history at Leeds University and then from 1994 at Oxford University Department for Continuing Education. Uh, she's had a long-standing interest in Central Europe and the Czech Republic and with her husband Peter she co-authored a book on Baroque churches in 1969. Uh, since the Velvet Revolution in 1989 Caroline has taken numerous tours to the Czech Republic for Martin Randall and other organizations and thus knows the country intimately and has also seen the remarkable progress that has been made since then in heritage restoration and conservation. As Peter said, she's been a great supporter of the Friends from the time of our founding in 2007 and has given many authoritative lectures on our behalf, uh, for which we're most grateful. And we greatly look forward to her lecture tonight, which is entitled, as you can see, Imperial Baroque, Vienna and Prague. So thank you very much, Caroline, and over to you. Well, thank you, Barbara. Also, um, before I start, I would like to express um, uh, my thanks to Stephen Conlin, who's helped arrange all these pictures. And I'd also like to dedicate this talk to all our Czech friends who've had a very difficult time during the pandemic and coronavirus. And we all have, and we've all been stuck with it, but I wanted to remember them especially this evening. And this pandemic really reminded me of my first visit to Vienna, age 17, and seeing a very strange confection in the Graben. I was told that it was to commemorate an outbreak of the plague in 1679. And this became the starting point for my talk this evening. Now here we're looking at the heavily fortified city of Vienna in about 1680. It was a frontier town since Roman times and it became the main residence of the Habsburg emperors during the 16th century. The following century saw the Thirty Years' War which raged across Europe. It started as a religious struggle but it became a fight for hegemony between Habsburg Austria and Bourbon France, finally coming to an end with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 under the Emperor Ferdinand III, who, very impoverished, rewarded his followers with land. He was succeeded by his younger son, Leopold I, who witnessed the terrible plague in 1679. It was uh, reported that it claimed over a hundred thousand victims. Leopold um, made his way to safety in Prague. It seemed to have been especially bad in the Danube Valley. And once the plague was over, it was the custom to give thanks and raise a column to the Virgin Mary. And Leopold commissioned one from a well-known artist called Matthias Rachmuller. Next, please. He was, um, uh, now this project for the um, plague column was interrupted as four years later saw the siege of Vienna by the Turkish armies led by the Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa. Leopold fled, this time he fled to Passau 
and the situation was only just saved by the arrival of Jan Sobieski, the King of Poland, who with um, Duke Charles of Lorraine leading the troops defended, defeated the Turks at the Battle of Kahlenberg, just on the outskirts of Vienna. Duke Charles, who you see here on his white horse from behind, uh, went on to pursue the Turkish armies eastwards, capturing Budapest in 1686. And in his army was a brilliant young soldier, Prince Eugène of Savoy, who brought up at the court of Louis XIV and destined for the church, ran away and joined the imperial army. Anyway, on a lighter note, we are all the beneficiaries because this was the start of the um, introduction of Turkish coffee uh, and cafe society, while the baker after the siege baked the morning rolls, the royal baker, in the shape of the crescent. And when Marie Antoinette um, went to be Queen of France, she insisted on having her um, own baker still producing these rolls, which then became known as the croissant. And that's what we, in, it, we enjoy so much today. Next, please. Bravo. <laughs> yes. Well, this is no ordinary plague column. Rachmuller's idea was a pyramidal shaped column standing on a base of three wings with nine angels on it. And it was to be visible in this rather large area of the Graben. But unfortunately, he died in 1686. So the project was taken over by the court theatrical designer, a man called Francesco Bernaccini or Cini. Together, a whole team of artists and sculptors was to work on it. At the pinnacle, which you can't see very well, is a gilded group of the Holy Trinity carried by clouds that rise from the architectural base on which there are today only three angels. But if you walk around this monument, the main view shows the kneeling emperor gazing upwards while receiving his crown presented to him by a putter. Below the emperor, who I, I'm sorry, I've no pointer, but you can see him there, is the figure of faith who is vanquishing a graphic personification of the plague. And these are by Paul Strudel. She stands in front of a black hanging with a prayer allegedly written by the emperor, but I expect it was his confessor, and reliefs um, of scenes from the Old Testament. And these are supposedly some of the earliest designs by Johann Bernard Fischer in Vienna. The story is vividly told. It's a piece of pure theatre and Leopold had been destined for the church, but succeeded his older brother Ferdinand, who unfortunately died of smallpox. So he wasn't really anticipating becoming the emperor, but nevertheless, he was a great linguist, a superb musician. He composed, he loved opera, he loved ceremonial and never missed a festive mass. Uh, and altogether, he also loved hunting and riding horses, but he was squeezed uh, between the French in the West and the Turks in the East, and his reign saw continual warfare. But fortunately, he was very well advised. Next, please. Next. Next slide. That's it. Now, I just found it was very interesting to discover that Matthias Rauchmuller, who'd started to make the plague column in Vienna, also supplied the model for the statue of St. John of Nepomuk, erected on the Charles Bridge, with whom I'm sure you're all very familiar with this um, piece of sculpture. And it was put up in 1683, just about the same time, allegedly to mark the 300th anniversary of his martyrdom when he was thrown from the bridge for refusing to divulge the Queen's confession. And where he drowned, a crown of stars appeared. And there you can see him with his crown of, of stars. He was promoted by the Jesuits, who were major patrons of the church and the defenders of a Rome-centered revival of Catholicism. And as you probably know, in those parts of Central Europe, he's found on every bridge and greatly venerated. And he's also the saint you pray to when you've been falsely accused. Now, the majority of the architects and stuccoists and painters came from Italy, but at the end of the 17th century saw the emergence of two outstanding uh, architects, Johann Bernard Fischer, later he was ennobled and to become um, Fischer von Erlach, 
But for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to refer to him as Fischer and Johann Lucas van Hildebrandt, who was also a noble. Next, please. Next slide, then. Johann Bernard Fischer was born in Graz, in Styria, and he was the son of a sculptor. And at the age of 18, in 1674, he left for Italy, only returning in 1686. So he missed the, um, the terrible plague and the siege of Vienna while he was in Rome. But within four years of returning, he was firmly established and soon greatly sought after, creating his own architectural style from a wealth of experience and knowledge he'd gained in Rome under um, an artist called Philip Score. The Scores were a family who came from the Tyrol, but they were much sought after as architects, painters, sculptors, working at the papal court and producing all sorts of temporary decorations, um, including painting the outsides of coaches that's recorded. And they were very closely associated with Bernini's studio. Uh, and um, as I say, uh, producing festive decorations and architectural ornament. Now he introduced, um, Philip Score introduced Fisher to um, the circle uh, who were gathering around Queen Christina of Sweden, who had um, come to Rome. And she assembled a whole lot of scholars and very intellectual people around her. And it seems that Fisher has the entree there to all sorts of interesting archeologists and, and people, it's all recorded. But what is important, I think, is that Bernini had a profound effect on him. And I'll just give you not least this example of the Four Rivers Fountain in Piazza Navona, which is an amazing imaginative work, glorifying the all embracing power of the church with its triumph over paganism. Innocent X had found um, this obelisk, which he decided to have erected opposite his palace. He was the Pamphili Pope and he employed um, Bernini to um, turn it into some sort of fountain. Well, what quite a problem. What do you do with an obelisk in Piazza Navona? So Bernini had the idea of gathering up enormous chunks of travertine marble. And then the theme is the four rivers of the world, um, the plate and the Ganges and the Nile. And here you see um, the river Danube, um, which is really relevant for us. And you notice that as the figure's arms go up, you see the papal tiara and the cross keys and a wonderful horse coming out from uh, the archway. And the water in this fountain absolutely gushed, rather different from the 16th century fountains when it only, they only spurted. I think this had quite a, a profound effect on um, the young Fisher. Next, please. Now, it's interesting that Philip Score's father had worked on Bernini's Cathedra Petri in St. Peter's, here seen through the Baldacchino, which is the real climax of the church triumphant. Again, it's a pure piece of theatre and it was to have great repercussions. Next, please. Next slide. Please. Well, with the relief of the Turkish threat and that having sort of calmed down for a bit, Vienna became a building site. And one of the first palaces to be completed was for the Prince Johann Adam Andreas of Liechtenstein um, by the Italian architect Domenico Martinelli. He bought it off the Kaunitz family who'd started it. Now, Martinelli had been the director of the Academy of St. Luke in Rome, and he'd come north to Vienna. So when you look at it, it looks like a Roman palace. And you look at the central bays of this vast building, they're slightly set forward. And it's articulate, the centre part is articulated by giant pilasters between the windows, which support a cornice, and then it's topped the top finishes with the balustrade with sculpture and over the windows you'll notice that on the piano nobile there are triangular pediments um, so it has a sort of classical feel of a Roman palace. Next please. Now I think the idea quite clearly came 
uh, from um, buildings like this. This was built by Bernini in Rome. It's the Chigi Palace. I'm showing it in, in a print. But when you look at the arrangement of the central block with those giant pilasters and the balustrade and the figures on the top, and also the columns on either side of the entrance, one can see pretty clearly where the inspiration came from. Next, please. With the coming of peace, it suddenly was possible to build beyond the fortifications. And one of the first uh, was the same Prince Liechtenstein who, who um, commissioned a garden palace in the suburbs of the Rossa. Uh, and for him, Fischer designed a French garden closed off um, by a belvedere. And in this print, it's one of the many um, imaginative designs he made of a whole variety of buildings. It would close off the gardens, you could go up the stairs and provide uh, a pleasure place from which to admire the countryside through the arch. And you will see it's a little bit like stage scenery too. And on either side of his drawing, it's framed by a pair of highly decorated urns which are a recurring feature in Fisher's work. Next, please. Well, luckily for us, um, Bernardo Balotto, who was Canaletto's nephew, uh, came to Vienna uh, round about 1759-60 and has left some wonderful painted records. And this, in fact, is the Liechtenstein Garden Palace seen from the side. But if you look into the distance, you should be able to see uh, Fisher's um, Belvedere at the end of the gardens. Uh, along the terrace, you will also notice his, these great urns, these great decorative urns. And the figures in the foreground, um, unfortunately, the Prince Liechtenstein died in 1712 and it was left um, to another member of the family. Um, I think he's Joseph Wenzel, Wenzel Joseph. So you see him and his wife sitting in the foreground. Uh, next, please. Now, two of Fisher's early works, or three, in fact, are to be found in Moravia. Prince Liechtenstein had a country estate at Lednice, close to the Austrian border, and commissioned Fisher to modernise the old house and build some very grand stables, which you can see in this print. It's a wonderful print and has been pointed out that the horses are cooling themselves in the pool in the middle. <laughs> it has been described as a palace for horses. Well, it's interesting, the prince's father, Carol Eusebius, was a very keen architect, even writing his own book on architecture and undoubtedly would have encouraged his son. If you look at the, um, uh, inset at the top right, you will see that uh, the house, in fact, at Lednice, the Liechtenstein house, was completely done over in the 19th century. But luckily for us, the stables do remain, so you can get a taste of it. And the last time I was there, the interiors of the stables were, uh, for the horses all had their original fittings. It's had many different uses uh, lately, but I'm not sure what the exact state is um, today. Next, please. Oh, now, this is, this is one of the strangest sites in Moravia. It's uh, um, Vranov, a frontier castle mentioned in 1100 with a complicated history and many changes of ownership, was bought by Michael Jan Graf Altan, um, who was married to a Liechtenstein in 1680, which was a year when plague also arrived in Vranov. It was in a pretty terrible state. So he commissioned Fisher to rebuild it as a comfortable family home, as they say. It's high above the river Die, on the edge of a uh, and right on the edge of the precipice, uh, Fisher built a great oval hall on the site of the old chapel. It's covered by a drumless dome, and he intended it to be hidden, I think, by a high parapet. You find these drawings, you find these designs in his drawings. And he also provided the plans for a new chapel, which you see on the right hand side, this yellow building with a dome. Uh, next, please. 
This great oval hall is dedicated to the Altan family and also their ancestors. The architecture, the painted decoration and the sculpture all come together to produce a unified effect to glorify the family. And so you could take it as a complete example of, uh, of Baroque in inverted commas, um, and it's still intact. The hall has 10 deep niches for windows and the door, and between them 10 niches which contain the statues of the Altan family. If you look up above the um, oval cornice, you'll see the uh, great dormer windows, which light the dome, and also um, very much a feature of Fisher's architecture. Next, please. Next. Now, this is a statue of Eberhard of Tham, and um, between the windows, you see two pinky colored pilasters frame a niche, and each of them contains a statue of one of the ancestors. Now, what interested me was to find that they were sculpted by Tobias Kracker, who'd worked on the plague column in the Graben. So he'd gone along with Fisher, obviously. Had I known I was going to one day give a talk about this, I would have uh, obviously um, taken the uh, photograph of the statue of Michael Jan Graf um, Altan, but um, that wasn't to be. So if we look up, next please. The ceiling above is painted by Johann Michael Rotmar, who came from Salzburg, that area, and trained in Italy and Venice, and would have been familiar with the large fresco cycles um, in, in Italy of the period. The lower part of his painting has allegorical representations of the Altan family. The large painted oval frame reveals the patron as Apollo, accompanied by fame across the sky. And the illusion is heightened by this large piece of drapery or carpet or hanging, or whatever, which is tumbling over the edge of the frame, upheld by the putto. So this altogether hangs together as a, a very good example of Baroque decoration. Next, please. Now, before we leave Moravia, um, in Brno, in the cabbage market, I don't know how many people have been to the cabbage market of Brno, but I have quite a number of times, it's usually full of uh, market, is this unexpected, well, it looks like a pile of stones, but in fact is a fountain. And it was interesting to find that this was actually designed, commissioned from Fisher. And it, when you look at it, it's not surprising if you think back to Bernini's Four Rivers Fountain in Piazza Navona. Now, although it acquired the name Parnassus, the fountain sculpture, again executed by Tobias Kracher, in fact symbolized Europe and the figure on the top represents Europe. And hidden amongst all those stones are allegories of ancient empires, which are very difficult to see, I must say. And there is an arch, which again is hidden, unfortunately. I didn't take this photograph. Um, and in the arch, there is the figure of Hercules, uh, the symbol of strength and courage, holding onto the three headed Cerberus in chains. And water should really be gushing out here, and it, it's obviously been photographed on a dry day. But what it really represents is the city's loyalty to the emperor. Next, please. Next, please. Um, my recognition came to Fisher with his two triumphal arches, which were put up to mark the entry of Leopold's son Joseph into Vienna on his return from his coronation as King of the Romans in Frankfurt. One must realise that these were temporary structures, but they are recorded in prints. I'm only showing you one of them. But above the arch, framed by the two columns of Hercules, which were the emblems of the Habsburgs, going right back to Charles V, you will see if you look closely, seated 
the 12 year old Joseph, who's shown as Apollo against a sunburst in front of the world. It's full of um, emblems this, with his parents who are seated on top of the world above. It's the most amazing um, confection really. And there were two of these produced for his entry. And at this point, Fisher was appointed drawing master to the young prince, as well as chief inspector to the imperial buildings. Next piece. At this time, he produced his greatest architectural project, which was to be a palace on the site of a modest hunting lodge on the edge of the Wienerwald, which would not only be suitable for a Holy Roman Emperor, but it would also outdo Versailles. So there was this terrible sort of competition between the two. Well, it, um, the design um, has echoes, in fact, of Versailles, and it has this um, wonderful central concave section, which brings to mind Bernini again and his unexecuted designs for the Louvre. It is an amazing project. One can spend hours looking at every detail, which I'm afraid we haven't got this evening. But um, as you can imagine, it was never realized as the ideas of the emperor and his architect went far beyond the capacity of the state treasury. Couldn't possibly afford anything like that. However, I think it quite likely was um, designed by Fisher as a presentation piece. And he went on to make variations for these great palaces, which are, are recorded. Next piece. Now, Prince Eugène of Savoy, who you see here in this portrait by Jakob von Schuppen, 1718, was one of the greatest figures in Austrian history. A great military genius who served three emperors, Leopold I and his two sons, Joseph I and then Charles VI. He fought with Marlborough at Blenheim in the War of Spanish Succession. He was president of the Imperial War Council and he fought continually against the Turks and there are a whole series of battles and eventually um, they surrendered Belgrade, which is a long way from Vienna, um, which um, led to the peace of Pasarowicz in 1718. But apart from his military prowess, which is um, fascinating and stupendous and another subject, he was also the most influential patron of the day and a great collector. Next piece. For him, Fischer built a town palace in the Himmelfortgasse, which his contemporaries considered one of the most beautiful buildings in the inner city. But I can tell you it's very difficult to see if you go there. Both Lady Wortley Montague was there and Dr. Burney, who was writing his history of music, commented on the narrowness of the streets. And this is the reason I'm showing it in a print. The arrangement of the palace again owes its origins to Bernini, I think, but the effect is made by the great wealth of decoration, which all alludes to its owner. This print with all the procession in front really records an embassy of the envoy of the Grand Vizier of Turkey in 1718. And the palace was greatly extended. Um, it started small, then he had to buy up houses on other, as he became richer. And, uh, but in essence, the design was actually Fisher's. Next, please. Now, um, on, this is just two details of what you see today. On the left hand side of one, there are reliefs on these entrances. And in this particular ent entrance, um, Santi Santino Bussi, a sculptor, uh, made reliefs. You can just make it out on the very left of Hercules and Anteus. And on the other side of the arch is Aeneas rescuing his father from burning Troy. Little of the original decoration of the interior survives, um, but there is this monumental staircase, 
which is held up by massive Atlantis figures um, by Giuliano Giuliani. And as you go up the stairs, you're confronted with this, I think, rather languid vision of Hercules. Doesn't He seems to be off duty there, I always think. However, there are descriptions that leave the impression of sumptuous coloured hangings, mirrors, paintings, mostly of battle scenes, as you would imagine, and rare furniture. Now, throughout the 1690s, um, Fisher was fully occupied with commissions in Salzburg, and he soon ceased to work for Prince Eugène. Now, I'm afraid this evening we're talking about Vienna, and so I not going to be going to Salzburg, but there are many buildings for anybody who visits Salzburg, you will um, find them, a lot of things there by him. Uh, Prince Eugène found something much more to his taste in the elegant work of Johann Lucas van Hildebrandt, who um, had been born in Genoa, his father was German and in the army there, and he grew up and he accompanied Prince Eugène as a siege engineer in Italy. He'd been to Rome and um, when he came back to Vienna he was employed by um, Prince Eugène to extend his palaces. Next please. Now although principally a secular architect, Hildebrandt designed a number of churches and he took over rebuilding the Peterskirche, which is a church which is just off the Graben. Traditionally, it was founded by Charlemagne, and it was briefly started by an Italian architect, Gabriele Montagni, who um, provided it with an oval ground plan. But typical of Hildebrandt is the central section of the entrance doorway, which if you look above the entrance, you'll see that it is sort of concave, framed by these pilasters set at an angle. And the central section is literally um, squeezed between these um, rather short bell towers, which are set at an angle, um, framing the dome. And the whole thing gives you a, a feeling of a lively curving facade. It's sort of interesting. Next, please. The interior, it's a small centrally planned church and it has a wealth of decoration. The dome is again frescoed by Rotmar, the man who frescoed um, the ceiling at Vranov, and it's decorated with the Ascension of the Virgin. Now, there is the work of many contemporary artists are found in this church. And of particular interest uh, to me at the moment is the one which you can see, it's hard to make it out, but it's on the right hand side of the opening to the choir, sort of golden blob, I think, in the photograph. But perhaps we could see a detail. Thank you. Next. Next. No, that's. Now here you will see on this altarpiece in more, much more detail. If you look closely, you'll be able to make out the saint, St. John of Nepomuk, thrust from the Charles Bridge overboard, clutching his cross. And um, below the arches of the um, bridge, you see vertical pieces of silver. And against those vertical pieces of silver, which um, represent the water, you will see his crown of stars. It's a brilliant work by Lorenzo Mattielli, Mattielli and of 1729, and this is interesting because it's the year after St John of Nepomuk was canonised, and um, it is a really superb piece of silver and goldsmith's work. Next please. Now the superb craftsmanship of the Viennese goldsmiths is evident in this famous monstrance, which was commissioned by the Countess Kolovrat for Loretta in Prague, to whom she left, and I'm not quite certain it's absolutely true, but five and a half thousand diamonds, is what they say, that adorned, that had adorned her wedding dress. The figure that upholds holds the monstrance is the Immaculate version, Virgin and is actually made from a drawing by Fisher. It's known as the Son of Prague with its 52 rays. I think it goes to illustrate 
the piety of the nobility. And it's interesting that when it was completed, um, it was taken to Prague um, and to the Loreto by Maria Lobkowitz, who was accompanied by five of the Imperial Guard. I mean, that's quite an undertaking to take that uh, all the way to Prague, this lady, well guarded though. Um, talk about transport of works of art. Um, anyway, it's interesting that also um, Fischer designed the great tomb in St. Vitus Cathedral uh, for St. John of Nepomuk, which was carried out later by, again in Vienna, by a silversmith called Corradini. Next, please. I have mentioned the importance of the Jesuit order in the Counter-Reformation, and this is the Jesuit church in Vienna, which was built by an unknown architect for the Emperor Ferdinand II in 1627. And in comparison with what we've just been looking at, looks rather old fashioned. Mm -hmm. However, next piece. In wow. 1702, Leopold I summoned Andrea Pozzo from Rome to modernize the interior. Now, Pozzo's great work is in St. Ignazio in Rome where he celebrated the missionary work of the Jesuits in a monumental fresco extending the space with illusionistically painted architecture. Here in Vienna, as in St Ignazio in Rome, there was no dome, and as you see for Baroque architects, the, the dome is very much a feature and very important. But Pozzo was able to paint it so realistically um, illusionistically, that when you go and you look up at first, it really does deceive the eye. Well, he's an interesting artist and he wrote um, Pex Perspectiva Pictorum et Architectorum, uh, which is a manual on perspective, which he dedicated to Leopold I and was obviously used by many artists. Next, please. Well, Pozzo was swept up by Prince Liechtenstein to paint the ceiling of the Great Hall in the Liechtenstein Garden Palace, which I showed you the Bolotto earlier on. And it was to be an apotheosis of Hercules. Now, his, here, his painted illusionistic architecture rises uh, uh, from the cornice as a background for the stories of Hercules and above it's opened up to the sky. The gods float on clouds and from where Hercules is uh, welcomed by Jupiter who's in the middle, you can just see his legs sticking up, um, to Mount Olympus. So this amazing piece of decoration, which is quite um, stunning, um, is really an allegory of the prince who was always known as Hans Adam the Rich. And uh, I think the Liechtenstein still probably live up to this kind of thing. Um, it's all its color and its vitality. It is one of the great Baroque ceiling paintings north of the Alps. Yeah. Pozzo died in 1709, but ceilings and his work had a profound influence on subsequent decoration of abbeys and palaces in Central Europe. Next, please. In 1701, with the outbreak of the War of Spanish Succession, Austria made an alliance with Britain and Holland, which gave Fischer the opportunity to travel in Northern Europe. And he went to London and he most likely met with Christopher Wren, who was rebuilding St Paul's at this time in the city of London. Um, it was an eventful time because in 1705, the Emperor Leopold died and he was succeeded by his son, Joseph I. It was also uh, at that time that Fisher started a, very, a major project in his life his Entwurf einer historischen Architektur, which um, is his sketches for a history of architecture, which eventually he dedicated um, to the Emperor Charles VI. And it came out in five books. And there are two books which contain um, illustrations, 
not only of his history, which was very learned, but also of his own designs and palaces. And it was published in 1721 and had obviously great influence and also in English in 1725. Now, he, um, uh, he, he um, produced um, designs for palaces such as this, which is the Bohemian Chancery, seen from the Judensplatz. The main facade is on the Wipplingerstrasse, have I got that right? Um, and it's much larger. Uh, but I want to show it partly because it's the Bohemian Chancery and it was from here that Bohemia was governed at this time, but also to draw attention to the decoration and also the decoration on the entrance. Because on this particular entrance, of which there are two on this facade, you will see that it's framed by very animated turns, which became a very Viennese motif. Next, please. Now, these are just details of um, two of the doorways um, designed by Fisher. The one on the left comes from the Bohemian Chancery, showing these absolutely delightful terms. Um, these are really figures who um, grow out of um, usually vertical statues, but by now they've been refined into tapered, um, sort of tapered bases. And in this case, you have the one on the uh, left who is looking upwards and the one on the right who's sh um, shading his head. I think they must probably be day and night. On the other uh, right hand side, you will see um, another doorway by um, Fisher. This, um, he was um, asked to refashion the Dietrichstein Palace, which had been built by an Italian architect and Carla. Um, and he was asked to redo it for the Lobkowitzes, who were very powerful in Vienna. And I'm showing it because the doorway is typical of Fischer with its so-called diadem arch. Um, and that is the arch which is slightly pushed up um, and it um, supports the balcony above which is the window and then their great coat of arms above. Um, on either side are columns which are set at an angle, which go up to bases, on which you will see once more um, there are urns, um, Fisher urns. Next, please. Now, um, the Oberhofmeister, or Lord High Steward, at the court of Joseph I, commissioned Fisher to build a huge palace with a garden beyond the fortifications. And what is very interesting is that here the sculptural decoration on this much more classical building celebrates Graf Trautzen. And he's shown on Mount, Olymp on Mount Olympus in the pediment and the whole thing is surmounted by an Apollo. So what was new really here was to celebrate the deification or the apotheosis of the owner no longer on a painted ceiling but actually on the main facade. Just think back to St Paul's Cathedral of the same period and if you think of the pediment there, it shows the conversion of St Paul by Bird with um, St Paul on the top of the pediment. I don't expect anyone ever looks at it very much, but it's very similar to what we see here. Next, please. Next. Um, just to put a contrast uh, to show you the Kinski Palace, which was built by Hildebrandt, because this makes the real contrast between the two architects. It's much lighter, much more decorated, with those tapering pilasters, which even have in the center have decoration flowing down them. And you will see on either side, these delightful dancing figures of the Atlantis. Um, I don't think Rome made a, a very great impression on Hildebrandt, but he was really more interested and has a greater affinity with the architecture that you find in Piedmont. Next, please. In the same year, um, Fischer um, began the Clam Gallas Palace in Prague. Graf Gallas was Marshal of Bohemia, Imperial Envoy in London, and the Papal Court, and Viceroy of Naples, where he sadly died in 1719. But Fischer was faced with a very awkward site. Uh, that the, where he had to build a palace incorporated a medieval tower. It was in a very narrow street, 
So he got over the problem really by building a very high palace, which is divided really into three sections, two outside towers and then the central section. They just project a little while. And the main entertaining rooms of this palace um, were made for the top story. Likewise, much of the invisible decoration, which celebrates its patron. Next, please. Okay, next. Next, please. There we are. Um, well, notable on the exterior, here we are in Husover Street by the Klamgalas Palace, are these great Herculean figures um, that carry the balcony and the characteristic vases again on either side of the window. And these are the work of Matthias Bernard Brown, known as the Benini of Bohemia. There was far greater love for sculpture, I think, it's much more robust, in Prague and in Bohemia, where they were far less rooted, obviously, in the imperial ideal. Next, please. In the Church of St. James is um, this funerary monument to the Chancellor of Bohemia. He was Jan Václav Fratislav of Mitrovice. It was designed by Fischer, and you can see immortality is symbolized by the ancient Egyptian pyramidal form, which, although you can't quite see the bottom of her, is inscribed by fame. The figure of glory crowns the deceased, who always amuses me because he reclines on his tomb propped up by books, between a very realistic figure of time and also uh, uh, the weeping figure of grief, which is extremely moving. And they are, in fact, by the other great um, um, arch um, sculptor working in Prague, um, uh, um, Maximilian Brokhoff. Um, now, the source for this, I think, is very interesting. I think it goes back to Raphael's um, tomb for Agostino Chigi in Santa Maria del Popolo, which also had this pyramidal form. Unfortunately, Raphael died and it was uh, left unfinished until the 17th century when Bernini was invited to complete the Chigi Chapel and you'll find two very similar designs of tombs in there. And I feel this is what gave um, Fischer the idea. Next, please. Now, the plague broke out again. I think I'll be very quick with this because I see time running away. The plague broke out again in 1713. The Emperor Charles VI, who had unexpectedly succeeded his brother Joseph I in 711, because Joseph had died of smallpox. And um, Charles had been destined to rule Spain. He was called Charles III of Spain, but he had to return to Vienna and he became the Holy Roman Emperor again. And he made a vow that on deliverance from the plague, he'd build a church. Well, it was a competition, Fischer, Hildebrandt, the Bibiana, and um, luckily Fischer um, won the competition. Now, this church is dedicated to St. Charles Borromeo, who is both the namesaint of um, the emperor and the patron saint of plague victims. It was built beyond the fortifications and the foundation stone was laid in 1716. It has a remarkable facade. Um, which is um, really unique. Um, and you'll see there's a sort of screen in front of the body of the church. And in the central section, there is a temple-like front with a pediment in, on, in which is the apotheosis of St. Charles Borromeo. And there are two low towers on either side, but between those into the curves snuggle these um, very tall columns. Now these are reminiscent of Trajan's column, so we're talking about Rome. Um, if you go up to the, you will see that there are the Habsburg eagles and then they're crowned by lanterns uh, which are topped with the crown with the cross on it. Um, now this sort of strong verticality of the columns really counteracts the horizontality of the facade. It's an amazing building. Next, please. This is a detail of one of these columns, um, derived obviously from Trajan's column, but they are carved with the scenes from the life of St. Charles Borromeo. 
and they know that Carl Gustav Harris, um, who was a great scholar, produced this, um, was re responsible for the programme of decoration. But you also have to remember about these columns being the the Hercules columns being the symbol of the Habsburg, and there are also references to the two um, columns that stood outside the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon, um, which translated um, their names mean um, fortitude and constancy, which were the motto also of the emperor. So the whole thing is, 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 is full of allusions to these um, different emblematic uh, points. Well, we'll look inside and show next piece. Um, just very briefly, this is the plan which shows you this um, long um, facade and the oval, um, which is set at a right angle, which is the nave of the church with very shallow transepts. Next, please. The interior space I always find is fairly somber articulated with giant Corinthian pilasters on high pedestals as favoured by Palladio and carry this entablature from which rises the drum and then above that there's the ring with these large windows of fissure windows which we've seen before. Next please. Now um, Fisher died, unfortunately, in 1723, and the work on the church was taken over by his son, um, Joseph Emmanuel Fisher von Erlach, who made considerable modifications. The high altar itself was designed by Fisher and represents a stage in the apotheosis of St. Charles. Now, if you look really carefully above the altar, you should be able to make out um, in stucco a figure. Um, with his arms up, and he's being carried up to heaven, supported by angels. And above is a great sunburst of gilt rays, reminiscent of the Cathedra Petra in St. Peter's. But alas, when Joseph Emmanuel came to um, make changes to his father's plans, he built something so that no longer does the natural light flow in through the sunburst, which is really rather a shame. Next, please. The dome is painted again by um, Johann Michael Rotmar, and it depicts St. Charles Borromeo interceding with the Virgin Mary on behalf of the people of Vienna. Um, compared to the Hall of Ancestors at Ranoff, the illusion is less obtrusive, and Rotmar's palette here has become much lighter. The Karlskirche is undoubtedly Fischer von Erlach's masterpiece, where he succeeded in his aim of creating a model for a truly imperial Baroque style. But it's interesting that he had very few followers. Well, I haven't quite finished, but I would just like to finish with a few more pictures if it's unallowed. And uh, next, please. From the 1690s, Prince Eugène had been buying up land near the Karlskirche during the War of Spanish Succession. Hildebrandt had been laying out gardens. And at the end of the war in 1714, Hildebrandt built this modest building at the bottom of the sloping ground. The central section is two stories high and it contains the marble hall. Next, please. Next. The walls here are clad in dark brown marble with very fine stucco decoration and illusionistic views by Gaetano Fanti on either side of the fireplace. But it's really the ceiling that's so interesting here. Next, please. The ceiling opens up to reveal an allegory of Prince Eugène at the victory of Peter Verdain of 1716. Uh, and this was painted just immediately, shortly afterwards, by Mar Mar Martino Altamonte. And after the battle, Pope Clement XI presented him with a crown and a sword. Now, if you've got very clear eyes and you look 
look at the sky and you look towards the left hand side at the bottom on a black cloud or maybe I can point to it I've got a point now you will see here the figure um, who is holding the sword and the crown which was um, bestowed on him by the Pope and here's Prince Eugene um, on his chariot as Apollo once more being carried off it's a very um, rich um, decoration and the artist had come from the court of Jan Sobieski. Next please. The building itself is arranged as an enfilade of rooms and this is a contrast. This is the marble gallery with marble statues in niches and very fine stucco decoration by Santino Bussi. Since 1923 it served as the Austrian Baroque Museum and you'll see in the foreground a figure of Maria Theresia uh, by Franz Xavier Messerschmitt, a famous piece of sculpture in lead. Next, please. Next. Hildebrandt went on to build him the lavish Upper Belvedere, which was designed primarily for receptions as well as showing off his art collections. The fanciful exterior was covered with decoration and the entrance facade here you see is beautifully re reflected and it's designed to be reflected in the pool of water in the front. Next please. From the entrance we come to the very grandiose staircase which leads to the main floor but one has to notice the exquisite stucco decoration, again by Santino Bussi, and it's very light and it's very playful and much copied. I love these puttos upholding the lanterns. Um, the Great Hall, next please, on the first floor, is, dark, is a dark contrast to the staircase and clad in the sombre red marble. But the view, as painted by Bellotto from this room I think is extremely interesting because it shows um, down at the bottom of the gardens you can see the lower Belvedere and as one's eye, I can do this now, comes you will notice that this is the Stephens Dome and here is Vienna still with its fortifications and there is this um, piece of greenery or grass which was always kept free. It was called the glassy and it was kept free for defensive purposes. Um, here is the Karlskirche and you can see very well its relationship with um, the city of Vienna and the building in the middle which I haven't talked about is the Schwarzenberg Palace which was designed both by Fischer and Hildebrandt worked on it. Next please. If you go down uh, to the gardens, you go down into a garden room and one always has a surprise when you see the vaulting, which is upheld by these amazing um, figures, uh, really heavy figures that hold up the vaults, all covered in symbols of um, uh, military symbols of flags and things like that. It's, it's very, very powerful. Next, please. And if you look back, you'll see uh, this is Prince Eugène and Hildebrandt's showpiece on which no money was spared on what was a fairy tale palace with um, decorated walls and copper roofs, which had often been likened to a cluster of tents. Now, Prince Eugène died in Tested in 1736. So that was a problem. The Belvedere's became imperial property. He had no heirs. Um, his collections were sold and many paintings actually were acquired by his niece and are to be found in the gallery Sabauda in Turin. Um, next please. Prince Eugene's library was added to the new Imperial Hofbibliothek, which is today the National Library, which was built adjoining the Hofburg and had been designed by Fischer but was in fact carried out by Joseph Emmanuel, his son. It was built on the site of Leopold's old riding school. And as you can see immediately, it is much less Italianate in style, with its main entrance is a put on niche and there are no classical pediments, while the sculpture is all pushed up to the attic level. The group in the middle, at the top, uh, in the centre of it, is um, Athena, the, the, the goddish, goddess of wisdom who's trampling on 
ignorance and hunger. Um, and it's um, uh, very um, much more classical. And you can see perhaps the French influence in this um, sort of thin banded, well, I call it rustication. The equestrian monument that you see in the foreground is Joseph II, worked by Franz Anton Zana. Um, he succeeded his mother, Maria Theresia, in 1780. And behind that is the Spanish riding school. Next, please. In contrast to the exterior, the interior of the library is sumptuous and it's dedicated to the glory of the emperor. Um, one approaches the central hall from both sides through these long passages. This shows one of the entrances which you come through and then you will find that there are a pair of columns. Now, whether they were intended to be the Habsburg columns of Hercules, um, who knows, but they may be symbolic and there are little staircases behind them that take you up to the gallery level. Next, please. This opens out into the great oval central hall, which again, like in all Fisher's work, is at right angles to the main facade. In the statue, in the center is the statue of Charles VI in Roman costume, with eight statues of Habsburg emperors around him, his hall of ancestors. And he is depicted on the ceiling, which alas, I can't show you, by Daniel Gran as Lord of War and Peace and patron of the arts and sciences. And so you could say it was the crowning achievement of Austrian Baroque. Next, please. Now, Charles VI continually worried about the succession, which was elected and not hereditary. And in 1713, he'd introduced this extraordinary thing, which is in the history books called the Pragmatic Sanction that proclaimed the indivisibility of the Habsburg lands and made provision for them to be ruled by a woman in the event of the male line becoming extinct, which it did when he died in 1740 with no male heir. And he was succeeded by his daughter, Maria Theresia, who was aged 23. And she removed the court from Vienna to Schönbrunn, which had been built on the lower part of the estate a vast palace, but with little resemblance to the early ideas of um, Fisher's original designs. And here we're seeing um, it in the painting of um, 1759, again by Bellotto. Now, Maria Theresia inherited an empire that stretched from the North Sea to the Mediterranean, far down the Balkans, including Bohemia, Hungary, Transylvania, and parts of Italy. So she set about a large programme of reforms, laying the foundations for the House of Austria. But the great days of imperial building were over. Thank you. So that's the end. <laughs> Can I just call, come in here and um, thank um, uh, Caroline very much indeed. That was absolutely splendid. Um, and I mean, I, 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 I don't have, I do have questions, but I'm not going to ask them because I feel that other people should come in first. But I would just comment really, I, I, I think that the ability to be able to call up these skills um, is remarkable. And um, it's something that we have find very great, have great difficulty in doing today. The, the, the skills that are required to do that sort of work hardly exist and if they do they are extremely expensive to employ um, and I've always been amazed how the um, craftsmen of the period were able to um, translate their ideas straight onto the stucco work that they that they actually um, uh, achieved because there's a tremendous skill here and you don't have uh, clearly the stuccoing is a very complicated um, um, procedure and you don't have much time to do it so you know the building up of this work is just remarkable and how you set it out in the first place is just beyond me uh, you have to have a very 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 competent contractor and clerk of works to help you <laughs> right uh, from mark sullivan uh, at the end of your talk you suggest that the baroque period ended during the reign of Empress Maria Theresa. 
and you showed a painting of Schönbrunn Palace at the height of her rule. Did Baroque fade away before the Napoleonic Wars to be replaced with classical architecture and art decoration? Well, what a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Imperial Baroque, as I've tried to describe it with examples such as the Karlskirche, uh, probably did come to an end. But of course, there were all the abbeys and many buildings in Bohemia and Moravia that continued to be built in the Baroque style. So in fact, it did continue. And then it gradually peters out towards the end of the 18th century. And you get this move um, to classicism. So uh, I can say it did continue um, in the middle of the century. Does that help? <laughs> yes, I think that's true, isn't it? I think that's uh, that so often the case is that the, 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 the um, what we've been looking at is the sort of um, examples which are right out in front of the of the of the sort of baroque um, uh, period, and they were the sort of ones that were setting the setting the pace and setting the tone of what was to come, and then you get this sort of dissemination of ideas which filter down slowly into um, other parts of the of the country, and it happens obviously it happens here too. It happened here um, in the, in the sort of post Palladian era, and um, gradually these things filter out, and so they actually last for a very long time. The influences go on for a long time, and then, as Caroline says, they're superseded eventually by some something quite quite different. Look at them. So, um, if that does bring us to um, a conclusion, I'd like to finally thank Caroline very much indeed. For, I mean, it was a whistle stop tour, but it was and very concentrated, if I might say so. Uh, I think there's a great deal of. Uh, scope there for further reading and mm -hmm. we intend to put up a short bibliography um, on our website to encourage you to um, follow 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 this up but I'd just like to um, thank Caroline very much indeed and if you would unmute yourselves and um, make your appreciation <laughs> thank you